Well, Brother Brent's been all over the world preaching the gospel. He's pastor now of the Sweet Springs Baptist Church in Ardmore, Alabama. Several years ago, we had a Bible conference in First Thessalonians. And Brother Brent said somebody ought to go there and start a church. There hadn't been one there since about 400 A.D. And boy, God put that in our hearts. It's, there's one there now, praise the Lord. Doing well, what exciting times those were. And uh, God's used Brent in many, many places, and he's always been a blessing to our church, and sure love he and his family. So, amen, brother. Preach it out. What a privilege it is to be back with you. We rejoice in what the Lord keeps doing here at the church, and it's just a blessing to be together. And I feel the Spirit leading me to 1 John, so... First John chapter 3, I have two verses tonight, First John chapter 3 verse 15 and 16 together. The Bible says, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, wonderful positive statement in the Bible. And really what we have here, verse 15 is a negative statement, verse 16 is a positive one, and of course you don't go anywhere without a negative and a positive, you've got to have both, have to have both. So he says, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him, hereby perceive we the love of God, because... He laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you'd give us understanding of these two verses of Scripture, and Lord, what you want to impress upon our hearts tonight through them, I pray you'd do that. Thank you already for the preaching that we've heard uh, this week and tonight even, we pray, Lord, that you would seal it in our hearts and make a difference in our lives. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So he talks about hate in verse number 15, and then he talks about love in verse number 16. You can always tell a lot about somebody by what they love and what they hate. It sort of defines who we are. And the passage before us, we can see a lot of discussion in the passage about sin. And when we get to verse 15, we find a much deeper view of how God views sin. Man's comparative views of his sinfulness usually peak at murder. In other words, when you, when you ask somebody, you know, what's the worst thing you could do, it would be killing somebody. You know, you've often maybe witnessed to someone and you've asked them, do they know the Lord is their Savior? And they say, no. And they say, don't you know that you need to be saved? You, Can I talk to you about Christ? And they'll say, no, I, I'm all right. Why do you think you're all right? Well, I've never killed anybody. And that's the height of just how man looks at his own sin. He, he compares it to, to killing one. Because even... You know, even people in the jungle understand that murder is wrong. And they, they understand that physical uh, iniquity, even if they don't have a Bible, if they don't have a church, they don't have a preacher, they know it's wrong to kill somebody, they know it's wrong to steal somebody else's wife. That's just built into the conscience. But God's view of sin goes a lot deeper. And it's wonderful for me to see how, as John is writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, how much his words sound and look like the Master's words. And what you see in the Gospel of John is almost, that Jesus says, is almost repeated in what John is saying in his epistles. Now, now before I move on, I've got to be careful because I, I, I think I've got something I'm supposed to say, and, and I, I would like to go another direction. You know, there's some people that don't even believe that the text that we're reading, I'm talking about Bible-believing people, that even applies to us. And uh, because there's some things said in the passage that are very difficult. And so when you read a verse like, we know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. And he just said, if you hate somebody, you're murderer. So, you know, so if you hate somebody, then you're not saved. And so sometimes people look at a verse they don't understand. And so they'll just make an explanation for it. But it's better just say, I don't know, understand what it means. 
than just saying it has nothing to do with us. It has a lot, and maybe the last message in the chapter that I have, maybe we'll deal with a little bit of that. But as we look at it, it just seems like the things in the Gospel of John that Jesus said mirrors what, what the apostle saying here. And, and you, you know, when we look at the passage about all these things said about sin, he that committed sin is of the devil and about the works of the devil. Boy, are not the works of the devil running rampant in the world? And not just in the world, but the works of the devil are running rampant in the church, in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what destructive things are happening. And yet you look at those texts and you see he that committed sin is of the devil. And I appreciate how... A brother newcomer dealt with that today, you know, if, uh, if you're born of God, you don't commit sin, and how people try to change that and say, well, if you continue in that, then, well, that, that's crazy, because every one of us continue in sin. We just continue in a different one. You know, I, I've heard people say, well, that, that person, you know, can't be saved because they continually have this problem of fornication or drunkenness or something in their life, and God forbid. And I look, I know there's a lot of people there that aren't saved that say they're saved. Yeah. I, I understand that. I, I know that. I believe that. But, you know, I've never heard anybody say, this person can't be saved because they continually are proud. Yeah. I've never heard anybody say that. Sure. Have you? No. You know, I tell you what. So-and-so in church, you know, they've been here a long time, but they can't be saved. They're just so selfish. Why is that getting quiet there? I mean, <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So we look at the previous text and we say, oh, the proofs of salvation in our lives are the proofs of our nature. And yet if we're not careful, we'll slip into a mentality of, of comparing sins in a different way that God does. And so I, I think John is probably saying, you know, the Apostle Paul at this point has been dead for what, 30, 40 years? John has seen a lot in that first century of the church pass by. And he's seen a lot that goes through, that has gone through the body of Christ. And he talks about how the works of the devil are rampant and how people are of the devil and how our nature is supposed to be different. And then he makes a comparison. He says, this devil-possessed world and people that are controlled by the devil, even in the body of Christ, he says, I'll give you an example of that. Hatred. You know that wouldn't be my example. If I wanted to pick a reason to say why I don't think so and so saved, I would not go to hatred. You know what I found out through this year will be 30 years in the ministry. And by the way, sometimes if you ever wonder why Brother James preaches like he does or I do or why Brother Rick, some of us say the things we do, we have we've been so long in the ministry, we've seen so, so much stuff that we're trying to communicate something to stop the insanity. And it's hard to do that. After you've seen so many broken lives, you've seen the devil do so many things, but at 30 years of ministry, I tell, tell you what, it's the hatred, and hatred is supposed to be something that is a characteristic of the world. Did you not see that in, the Bible said that in Brother Rick's text, he said in verse, uh, where was it, 13, marvel not my brethren if the world hate you. But here he's not talking about the world's hatred, he's talking about, he's talking about brethren's hatred. Hatred. We know they hated Jesus, we, we know they hate us, but man, us hating us? Now, look, that must be possible or he wouldn't say whosoever hateth his brother. If that couldn't be done, why would he say that? I think there's a lot more hatred going around out there than, than meets the eye. And what God is saying, that hatred is of the devil. That is devilish. And, you know, it, it's hard for us sometimes to see the viewpoint like God. And, and just like uh, John is saying, whosoever hateth is a murderer. And really, it seems like he got that from what Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter 5. You remember Jesus said, if, if you look on a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery with her already in your heart. So we look at, at the, the act and God looks at the inward heart. Because the act comes from an inward lust. 
And in the same passage in Matthew chapter 5, he, he talks about being angry with your brother. And Jesus said, you know, you've heard not to kill, but he said, I say unto you, he that is angry with his brother. And I think that's where John's getting that, to show us our innate sinfulness. We are wicked people. And we can see that by the inward attitudes that we have in our heart. And notice I didn't say that, I said we. I was preaching, and I preached out of Matthew chapter 5 this year. I, I went to Israel, took my son to Israel this past year. And uh, I was preaching at the, the first established Baptist church in the nation of Israel. It was in Nazareth, the hometown of Jesus. Can you imagine? And it was a huge building. It was all Arab, Arabic church, Arab Christians. And a huge building. And I don't know if you, ever, if you would have that opportunity, what would you preach on? I thought, man, I, I'm going to pray about this and fast. What am I going to pre preach, Lord? Where you were, where you grew up. What a privilege. And something just laid on my heart, and I said, what, really, that? I didn't understand. It was right out of Matthew 5. I got up that morning to preach, and this is... This, <laughs> My conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. I walked up to the platform. The translator introduced me. I introduced myself. People came in the back immediately, and all bedlam broke loose. People started screaming, hollering at each other in church. This is Sunday morning. They started pushing at each other, they, they came to blows. I'm talking, it was better, I and mean, I'm standing up here as the visiting preacher. My translator goes down. He's, he's over the pews. I mean, it was just a brawl. I thought, God, when you talked about Ishmael, you knew what you were talking about. <laughs> he's wild. Now, you say, why are you saying this? I, I'm saying, look, it's the same problem over there that it is over here. And, and they were just going crazy. And they got through being crazy and they were screaming and then people left the church and the translator, I mean it's a huge building and the translator walks back up and he's all angry and he says, okay. <laughs> and while they're fighting, I looked down at my text in Matthew 5 and I said, he that is angry with his brother without a cause. They were throwing punches. <laughs> And it talked about if they smite you on the cheek. You know what I said? I said, you live in a country here where so many people don't know Christ. And I said, they're never going to know Christ if you don't have some kind of change in your life. I started preaching to my translator, you know what I mean? <laughs> why, why are people with the divine nature of God in them so hateful sometimes? Why are we so full of hate? Yeah. You say, I don't hate anybody. I've, I've watched, I tell you what, husbands and wives don't get divorced because they love each other. Yeah. I've watched parents hate their children. I've watched children hate their parents. I've watched Christians hate other Christians. And you know, you, we live in a day where you may have to Separate your fellowship with some people, but that doesn't mean you hate them. I've put more people out of the church in the last two years than I probably have in my ministry. But it was of necessity. But I don't hate those people. But if you're not careful, you'll go through life and you'll, as Brother Baker was preaching, you'll be like Cain. And the Bible does say that whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and that you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. And I don't, I don't believe that at all, at all is talking about someone's salvation. I, and I'll, I'll tell you why in just a second. But as he, he brought up Cain, would you look at that verse 12 one more time? Not as Cain who was of that wicked one. Do you see that? Here's a question. Who was Cain's daddy? I'll never forget, I had somebody turn, when I, years ago in my ministry, Brother James will know where I'm going, to Genesis 4. 
And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare a son. Called his name Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And the guy said, see right there? He's a physical son of Satan. He said, you see that? I said, no. You know, there's enough Bible in there without you making up about four paragraphs in between a colon. <laughs> I think Adam knew his wife, and she conceived <laughs> and bare a son, and it was Cain. <laughs> oh, but brother, the Bible says in 1 John that Cain was of that wicked one. Yet it also says that you're of the devil if you commit sin. I wonder if we ever stop and, stop and just remove ourselves just a minute and say, boy, I tell you what, I'm full of the devil. Christians don't, because I'm a Christian. No, you're full of the devil. Well, how can I be full of the devil? Because I'm God's child. Looks like you're the devil's child to me. Because there's two natures there. Adam was Cain's father. But yet the Bible tells us he was of that wicked one. John 8, 44, been quoted already this week. Jesus said, you're of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. It wasn't that, that, the, G, that the devil had all these physical children out there. But there's a spiritual nature of that devil in them. Now watch this. Watch it in reverse, guys. We have the spiritual nature of God in us if we've been born again. We're the sons of God. But how many times do we manifest the nature of the devil in our life? And it's not just through fornication and adultery and pornography. I probably need to say that again. And pornography. And pornography. We might have revival in the church if we could get rid of of half of, the, half of the people in the body of Christ that are addicted to pornography and the other half that are angry at everybody. I'm talking about the manifestation of two different natures. And the Bible says that that whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. You say, you know, murder hath no, hath, doesn't have eternal life abiding in, in them. And yet... Some of God's people can be guilty of murder. And we know that because, you know, even Peter said that. Do you remember what Peter said in, in 1 Peter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? He said in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 15, But let it, none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Oh, how God looks at sin. He puts the busybody with the murderer. He's saying, manifest your nature right. Show people that you're a child of God instead of someone that is controlled by the devil in your life and controlled by this hatred that's in your life. You know, Peter got close himself to being a murderer. That sword that came down on that, if it wasn't for divine intervention, he'd have been a murderer. But I think John probably would have been guilty of that too. Remember when they were going to go to town and they wouldn't receive Jesus and John says, let me kill them, Lord. Yeah. Remember that? I'll call fire down from heaven and kill them. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, you don't know what manner of spirits you are. You know, that was probably pretty nice of the Lord. He could have said, you know, John, you're of the devil. Because that's not the attitude of a child of God. That's not the attitude of God. Not, it's to save men's lives, not to kill men's lives. Cain obviously hated Abel before he ever did anything to him. You see, people hating preachers and pastors and pastors hating congregations. You know, it'd be good if people just get honest. You know, most hatred is, is subtle and, and uh, feigned. <laughs> you know, it'd be, one thing I appreciate about Ahab, at least he stood up and they said, what about this preacher? He said, I hate him. At least he's honest. You know, there, I've had one talent. I've had a talent for causing people to hate me for some reason. I don't, I don't know how that happened. I don't hate them. But 
But, but you know, that, that hatred doesn't matter. You know, a, wife, a husband that go to his wife and say, you know, I hate you. Hey, well, maybe that does happen today. I don't know. But, but people have that in their heart, but they don't, they don't get honest about it, you see. They just let it brew in there. Hatred toward God and hatred toward each other. And John says, we need God to manifest his life through you and not the works of the devil to be manifested in us. And he says, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. Look at sin like God looks at those sins. We all, you say, can, can a Christian commit murder? Well, sure. Or he, it's just another sin like any other. Like he said in chapter 1, he, he said in verse 8, we say, have no sin, we're a liar, and we've got to confess our sins. He said in chapter 3 also here, we're to purify ourselves. And one of the things that we need to purify ourselves from is the hatred that boils up inside of us. Hatred. God's going to have a hard time working through his people and with his people with all that hatred going around. Quit being so mean. You know, we don't hate sinners. We don't hate each other. Y'all not hate anybody. Now, I despise some people. My wife's been in grand jury duty all week, and she's had to hear stories of pedophiles and rapists, and I despise those people. I don't hate them, but I really despise them. You know, you can despise, I I despise sodomites. I don't hate them. I want them to be saved, but I despise that. I despise liberal, progressive people. I, I just personally, I'm just being honest. Can we have a confessional here? <laughs> but, but I don't hate them. I don't want to hurt them. I don't want, to, I don't want them to go to hell. I don't stand up, I, I, don't, I don't stay awake at night wondering what I can do to them or how I can get them back or how I can be revengeful or going over and over in my mind about all the ways they've hurt me or disappointed me or made me upset. They, they don't encompass my mind and my thoughts. In the body of Christ, we need to purge out that, those hatred attitudes out of our hearts. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you know, and I know where the hatred comes from because, you know, people do you wrong. You live in a world. You know, I, I've seen missionaries hating other missionaries. I've seen pastors hate missionaries. Missionaries hate pastors. It's just crazy. It it is of the devil. It's the manifestation of the devil in people's lives. I I don't know why God has helped me not to hate anybody. And I I had a guy that got so mad at me while I was a missionary. He told other preachers and ministers that I had been secretly divorced and remarried. Spread it around. And I, I found out about a missionary come and said, Brother Logan, I just heard something. I said, oh yeah, what? I heard you were secretly divorced and remarried. I said, well, let me go talk to my wife. <laughs> I said, honey, did I lose my mind? No, honey, we, I've known you since. <laughs> Whew, where does that come from? The same place it came from when somebody got so upset at me years ago preaching on whatever, I don't know, that they, that they called the, the social services to say that I abused my children because I, I preached about, you know, chastening and with the rod and they come to my house. Who would do that anonymously? I'm not talking about lost people. I'm talking about brethren. Yeah. It comes from hatred. There was one woman, she'd come to the church that I pastored. She hated the church. She hated me, but she came there to get on my nerves. <laughs> she would sit down and she'd take her keys out and she would jingle them <laughs> while I'm preaching. I've had people that sit in my car and stick their tongue out at me while I'm preaching. Right. 
I, but you know what I had to do this afternoon? I said, you know, I need to give some illustration. I had a hard time trying to remember all the people that, you know why? Because I don't care. I, I don't hate anybody. And some people stay up all night about some wrong they've had in their life. And the manifestation of the new nature is I got a new man, you see? I don't hate anybody. I'm not going to kill anybody. We were in Romania, man. I, we, we had a guy. We, we, had, we had two Christian, wonderful men in the Bible Institute. And they hated each other, I guess. And one of them, they came in the church and one of them's nose was all bleeding because he just, just beat the devil out of him in the face. Over there, they're more honest about their hatred. <laughs> Over here, the hatred is just... I've got a prayer request. <laughs> well, I'm worried about brother so-and-so. Just hatred. It's just all of the devil is what it is. And God says, you're a murderer. You, you are a stinking murderer. And the way we look at things... We look at things from the outside and God looks at them from the heart. And Cain has this outward expression of who his father is as Adam, but he has an inward expression of who his father is as the devil. And the Bible says in verse 15, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. You say, preacher, does that mean people lose their salvation or this is in the tribulation? No, you wish it was in the tribulation. Then you'd have an excuse for being of the devil. No, eternal life abiding in him. John talks about eternal life so much, not just in his epistle, but also in his gospel. But look at this epistle. Look at chapter 1, verse 2, with chapter 5, verse 20. He talks about eternal, what does it mean for eternal life abiding in him? You know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding. What does that mean? 1 John chapter 1, the Bible says, verse 2, For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was manifested, excuse me, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. And he said in verse 1, we, we saw it with our eyes, we looked upon it, we, our words have handled it, our hands have handled it, the word of life. That word of life was eternal life. Look at chapter 5, verse John chapter 5, he says in verse 20, and we know that the Son of God is come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. Look at it. This is the true God and eternal life. The first thing John, I would say, says about eternal life is eternal life is personified. Eternal life is Jesus. Eternal life is the Son of God. But the second thing he says about eternal life, look at chapter 2, verse 25 of 1 John. He says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 25, and this is the promise that he hath promised us even eternal life. Here is eternal life promise. Eternal life is a promise of God. And I'm glad that God keeps his promises. So I, I not only know that eternal life is, in, is personified, it's in the person of Jesus Christ. God has promised me eternal life because I believed on his son. It's his promise has nothing to do with my state in this life. I am looking forward to the fact that I will have eternal life, not based upon what I do, but based that God has promised it to me, you see. But, he goes farther than that. Not just eternal life uh, personified and promised, but then look at uh, chapter 5 again. First John chapter 5, he says in verse 11, and this is the record that God hath given to us. Eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son of the life, he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Verse 13, these things have been written on you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. So it's not just a promise, it's not just a person, but it's also a possession. It's something that I presently have. But then the last one is our verse. Eternal life abounds. Abiding in him. And I'm not going to use another P. 
eternal life abiding in him. And this again is mimicking, not mimicking, but just developing the words of the master that John recorded for us in John 15. We were already there. And Jesus, what does he say? He says, abide in me and I in you. What does it mean for eternal life to be abiding in us? Look at that word abiding. It, it means to rest continually in. Do you know you can live with your wife and not abide with her? In other words, you can be in the same house. You can physically be there, but not be abiding with one another. You can be in a church. You can physically be in a church building, and yet not abiding with your brothers and sisters in love and in fellowship. It's not a physical location. And again, this is the contrast, I think, in the text. God is showing a physical action of murder and yet a spiritual inward attitude. And He's going to do the same thing with love. Love, though, it's a spiritual inward attitude. It needs to have a physical manifestation. Just like we have a physical nature, a physical flesh, a physical body that is of the devil, and yet we have an inward nature, a spiritual nature that is of God. And he says that eternal life needs to be abiding in you. And John 15 is a great text. He says, he says, if you abide in me, listen, and my words abide in you. Not just that you physically have them. Not just that they're before your eyes. Not just that you carry a Bible. But if the words of God abide in your heart, there is a closeness there. There is a resting there. There is a, relation, a fellowship there with that book. The reason that murder and hatred and sin comes out of our lives is because our eternal life is not abiding in us. And we know that a lot of Christians aren't abiding in Christ because if anybody abides in Christ, he says they'll bear much fruit. Amen. That's a fruitful... He's not talking about relationship. He's talking about fellowship. Now, is your eternal life abiding in you or is it just in some corner with the door shut? Is your eternal life abiding in you? Or have, has it not been manifested and come out in quite a while? You know that no murder hath eternal life abiding in you. John goes over that word abiding so many times, even in his epistle. And, and, and what he says, watch what he says. Twelve times in this epistle he talks about abiding. Look at chapter 2, verse 6, quickly. He says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked if you're abiding in christ and christ is a, if your eternal life is not just there but it's actually resting comfortably continually in your life then you will walk like jesus he said in verse number 10 of chapter 2 first john 2 10 look at it he that loveth his brother abideth in the light and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. Question, you know anybody that stumbled lately? Why? Because there was no abiding in the Lord. That new nature is, there, there's not a closeness there of that new nature in our life. It's not enough for you just to be saved. God wants that eternal life to abide in you and come out of your life. Look at verse 14. 1 John 2, 14, I have written unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men because you are strong and the word of God, look at it, word of God abideth in you and ye have overcome the wicked one. Why are we not overcoming the wicked one? We're not abiding in the Lord. Our eternal, eternal life is not abiding in our lives. We have the promise. We have the possession. We have the purpose. But there's something wrong with the living condition. First John 2, 28. And now little children abide in him that when he shall appear we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. You think Christians can be ashamed when the Lord comes? Why? 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 Because they got tattoos? Why? Because they dropped out of church? 
Why will Christians be ashamed at the coming of the Lord? Because they committed some heinous sin? Or because they didn't let that eternal life, that new nature abide in their lives? Which is the source of all of that. Hey, I'm an equal opportunity preacher. I preach on all the sins. But here's the thing. Look, here's the thing. Every one of us are guilty. And if we go back to the first chapter, we say we have no sin, we're a liar. And if, if, if God could get his people in the place where we'll hear what the Spirit saith to the churches and stay in the place of repentance of whatever that is we need to repent of, that's not a part of the new nature, but is of the devil. A lot of mothers doesn't know they're a mother of the devil in their house. A lot of teenagers don't know that they're the devil teenager in the youth group. Right. A lot of Christians that are middle-aged, oh, been in church all their life, don't know that they're the devil that's sitting in the pew. Because they're not allowing the new nature of Christ to be manifested in their life. He said in 1 John 3, 6, we are heard this week, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. You see, doesn't that put that in a different context? If I'm abiding in the Lord, I'm not going to live that, that life of the devil. Now, let's flip it to 16. I just got a couple minutes. Whosoever, he says, hateth his brothers a murder, and you know that no murder hath eternal life abiding in, in him. Verse 16, hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Oh, how God flips it. <laughs> When God talks about us, he tries to get us to understand his viewpoint. I'm not looking just about what you're doing. I'm looking in your heart. But when God tries to communicate to us so that we will perceive the love of God, as, as verse 1 says, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. But the only way that we could perceive that, he had to do something physical to show it. He flips it. I'm looking farther than you, but I know you don't look very far. So I want you to perceive that I love you. And I'm laying down my life for you. And I'm proving to you that I love you based upon what I'm showing you outwardly. We had, we had a young man we were working with. He, he said, I just wish God would make himself real to me. And God just doesn't seem very real to me like he, he's concerned about me, cares about me. I said, I said, God did something for you to prove his love for you that nobody else would ever dream of doing. He laid down his life for you to show you love, to assure your heart. And God loves a lot of people and people don't perceive it. That's because they don't look at the sacrifice that he made. And yet God did not just bestow his love upon me for me to enjoy it. He also bestowed his love upon me that I would pass that along to somebody else. And it's not just enough for me to say I, I, love, I love God's people. Now, guys, here, here's, where I, here's my problem. I don't have a problem hating people. Really, and I, I'm not being facetious. I, I don't have a problem. I, I don't hate people. I mean, the worst enemy I've ever had, I just go to sleep. I don't care. Really, I, I'm being honest. All the attacks on my face, I don't care. It doesn't bother me. But my problem is the other. Laying not, not saying I love people. No, no, no. That's not what he's saying, guys. He says, you know, you, we got two things, two natures. We got a physical and a spiritual. He said, I'm not just talking about you saying that you love people. I'm talking about you laying down your life for the brethren. You know what the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 16? He talked about Aquila and Priscilla, probably two of the greatest Christians in the history of the, of the church, maybe. He said, who for my sake, they laid down their own necks. They laid down their own necks. You know why? Because they loved him. And we can say that we love people, but until we start manifesting that love, it's not going to go very far. I'll give a personal illustration too. You know, we preach to people a lot. We ought to preach to people. We pray for people a lot. We ought to pray for people. But you know what else we need to do? We need to manifest our love by sometimes laying down our lives for people. Had a young person I was really concerned about. They were at a crossroads not long ago. 
and I found out about the depth of the crossroads right before church service. And they were about 30 something miles away. And my heart just dropped. I didn't know what to do. And I said, I got to go. I grabbed my keys. I jumped in the car. I raced down to this young person. I met this young person and I said, and as soon as I saw them, they, they knew it was church. They said, Pastor, you've got church. And I said, yeah, but I got something heavier on my heart right this minute. And she knew, that person knew how important that was to me to be in church, fulfill my responsibility. And you know, that, that little thing did more to prove my love to that young person than all the sermons that I could have ever preached her. Because in one act of love, I said, I've got, I've got to lay down what I do. I've got to lay down my life, and I've got to reach somebody with some love. The Bible says you can talk all you want to about how much we love God and one, we love one another, but the proof is in how we lay down our lives for the brethren. And he says in that verse that we ought to lay down our lives. You ought to go through the Bible and look at everything it says you ought to do. It's a big message. We ought. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Man, a lot of times I don't do what I ought. And what I ought to do, many times I fail to do. And my responsibility as a Christian and letting that Christian nature come through my life, what I ought to do doesn't always come out like it should. I'm, I'm finished. Would you go to Titus 3? Let me show you. Here, here's, here's my problem. I don't know about yours. I do not have a problem many times showing love and sacrificing myself for people that I know love me. But you see in our verse, he didn't say we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren that love us. He says we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren, period. And I think the great example would be Titus chapter 3. And verse 3, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy. What's that next word? Hateful. You should preach, I don't hate anybody. Well, why are you so hateful? Hateful, look at it, and hating one another. But look at the next verse. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. God's love did not appear to people that were lovely, but people that were hateful and people that were hating one another and people that were disobedient. And the lesson to me is if I have that new nature, that's the attitude that I'm reaching out. It's not me, but Christ has got to do that through me. Heavenly Father, I pray you'd help your people and bless your word. And God, it's easier to preach than it is to live. And I just pray that you'd help us tonight. That we might manifest the love of God toward this world and toward one another. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.